Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, honorable guests, dear friends, a very warm welcome to the workshop Economic Diversification in the Gulf States, Challenges and Opportunities. We are very honored and very pleased to have you. Thank you so much for joining. The workshop is conducted in two sessions, one today and one tomorrow. And I would like to have the opening remarks conducted by Dr. Haida Said, by Mr. Fabian Bloomberg, and by Dr. Hamid Ali. And Dr. Haida Said is the head of the ACPR, ACRPS, and I apologize, research department. Mr. Fabian Bloomberg is the regional representative to the Gulf states at the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. And Dr. Hamid Ali is the Dean of the School of Public Administration and Development Economics at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. Dr. Haider, please. Thank you, Dr. Frank. And uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and distinguished guests, all participants. First of all, I would like to welcome you to this workshop, which is organized in collaboration between the Arab Center with, with the Conrad Adinawar. And uh, this will, as Dr. Frank has said, it will be divided into two days and we'll be focusing on a very important uh, subject and that is the economic diversification in the Gulf states, the challenges and opportunities. This is a very important uh, theme to discuss. It has been discussed before, of course, and the discussion continues and I would like to remind our audience that in December of every year, we hold uh, a, a seminar on, or a forum on the Gulf affairs. And in 2016, oh, the theme was economic diversification. The papers were published in a book in 2019. So therefore, continuing this uh, the discussion on this theme is very important and it goes beyond the Gulf countries and touches more than one country in the Orient and especially in the uh, countries where their economies rely on uh, oil and gas, the rentier economies. And the question goes beyond diversification to the political consequences, the uh, relations between the state and the people and the other aspects. We are inviting a number of distinguished uh, experts and uh, academicians from Europe and Germany. So uh, we welcome them all and thank them for participating with us and uh, and as i said this is a joint effort by the arab center and the conrad Adinawar, and also strategic planners in fact will be taking part and following uh, our uh, discussions. I thank you again and welcome once again to this workshop. Thank you, Dr. Haida. Mr. Fabian, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Himpel. Uh, dear distinguished experts, colleagues and friends, uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening uh, to everyone wherever you are. And a warm welcome also from my side to our workshop on economic diversification in the Gulf States. Uh, first of all, I would like to cordially thank our esteemed partner, uh, the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies and the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies for co-organizing this event. Uh, thanks are due especially to Dr. Haider Said and Dr. Hamid Ali 
it's a pleasure working with you. Um, and I also would like to take the opportunity to sincerely thank our colleague, Dr. Mohamed Yadi from the Gulf States program, one of the masterminds uh, behind this, this workshop. Thank you all very much for setting up uh, this concept and, uh, and, and this, this, this program. And of course, I would like to thank um, all of our moderators and speakers for participating in this digital uh, workshop. It's not the first of its kind uh, uh, for the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, nor the Arab uh, uh, Center and, and the Doha Institute. And of course, uh, we are benefiting, let's say, from the fact that uh, the use of digital tools comes with a low threshold for participation and event organization. But the truth is also um, that in the old normal, we would have done this workshop in presence, for example, in Qatar or Germany. And we sincerely hope that we can return partially to the old normal soon and have a conference on this topic in Doha by the fall of this year, as we planned with Hamid. Because bringing people together is, let's say, the core idea of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. We are an advocate of dialogue. Worldwide, we deliver platforms for the exchange of ideas and knowledge transfer. Since more than 50 years, we promote especially dialogue, civic education and peaceful cooperation around the globe by running offices and programs in more than 120 uh, countries. And our program, the regional program Gulf States, was established in 2009 and its main objective are to improve mutual understanding and encourage dialogue and cooperation between the Gulf region on the one hand and Germany and European countries on the other hand. So we see ourselves as a, a networking hub to promote these ideals. In the Gulf region, we focus on four main areas, uh, economic development, women and youth empowerment, political and intercultural dialogue and security enhancement. And when it comes to the field of economic development, we encourage policies that follow the principles of economic diversification. So to this end, we support innovations of small and medium-sized enterprises as a means for the creation of new jobs and achieving economic prosperity. And we try to stimulate and support competition and entrepreneurship, especially when it uses sustainable and um, opens educational and employment possibilities for women and the youth. So these are, let's say, our guiding principles when it comes to the policies of economic diversification. We are um, the only German uh, foundation which has established such a close network in the Gulf region. Uh, we will continue to expand uh, this work as one of our goals is to bridge political and cultural divides and to build authentic uh, partnerships. In the last years, we uh, were able to conduct several exchange and dialogue programs for scholars, experts, especially young leaders from the Gulf and brought them to Europe. But of course, we also brought Europeans and Germans uh, uh, to the Gulf states. So for us, this people to people exchange is important because it helps to overcome prejudices and misunderstandings and also because we believe that the exchange of ideas, concepts and best practices is the way to bring about a sustainable peace, security and economic prosperity. And in this regard, we believe that platforms such as this workshop are a key to elaborate on challenges and opportunities and to provide the basis for an evidence-based informed decision-making. Uh, so again, uh, many thanks for our partners at the Arab Center and the Doha Institute, and mostly for our distinguished speakers. We are looking forward to learn from them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fabian. Dr. Hamid, please. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, also, thank you for our colleagues, Dr. Haider and Dr. Fabian for your remarks and to lightening the debate today. And also, ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, give my, uh, on behalf of my colleagues at the Dahuan Institute, the School of Public Administration and Development Economics. Let me thank our DI President, Dr. Abdulhab Al Afendi, for the encouragement to engage with our external partners to advance the policy dialogue. 
Also, without his support, these events could not have happened. Also, I will take this opportunity uh, to welcome you all in this virtual workshop with our partners in the regional program of Gulf State Conard. Uh, also, our colleagues at the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. And also, in particular, uh, here I should single out uh, our colleagues, Mohammed Yaga, for his smooth and his uh, effective way of organizing conference. And also, our colleague, Dr. Haider Saeed, who was also running all the coordination pretty smoothly. And I was pleased for all those ones. Today that we are holding this workshop that talking about economic diversity in the Gulf states. So this workshop is the beginning to set the foundation for future cooperation, including joint conferences and events to enrich the policy debate on issues that are vital to the well-being of this region. And the good thing about it, we have speakers from Germany, from Jordan, from Oman, from Kuwait and Qatar. All are coming from very fine institutions, would we'll be presenting range of issues on economic diversities. What does it mean, the economic diversity in the context of the Gulf states? Why the economic diversification matters? And to whom it is directed and how to proceed with a set of policy options. All these issues are easily said than done, but the opportunity bestowed to us by the digital age, economic knowledge, having sovereign funds can provide the leverage and options to diversify the Gulf state economies. And the focus on the human development is an entry gate for the knowledge economy and diversifications. However, there are challenges. And the first and the foremost is the nature of the rentier states, as has mentioned by Dr. Haider. And it's in this in rentier state has embedded social contract norms. Those norms almost have become the state ideology, harder to reverse overnight. Though it is challenging to maintain such a living standards in the face of the oil oil volatility and shocks. Second, the institutional capacity to translate policy component to strategies and to programs to mobilize resources to meet collective goals towards economic diversification might need a creative instrument to overcome those limitations. Given that physical imbalances and rising level of unemployment with the slowing down in economic growth during the pandemic put so much pressure to apply the austerity measures. However, the issue of economic diversification are complex, intricated and intertwined. There is no magic solutions. However, we need to use evidence to draw on our collective wisdoms to find a collective answers and hopefully the outcome of those to to, outcome, to to overcome those challenges. However, this workshop will pave the way for convening a bigger conference in the near future. And thank you so much. Thank you very much for the honor, Dr. Hamid. It is now this part of the workshop that we will hear four distinguished scholars with their presentations. I will quickly outline uh, the schedule of the events as per the agenda. As you are aware, we will have the four scholars presenting their thoughts and their ideas and their input to the workshop first. And then at the end, after those four presentations, we will have the opportunity for questions and answers. So it is with this that I would like to ask the four scholars to get prepared in a sense. And first of all, I would like to ask Dr. Hessa Aluyayan, and I will quickly introduce Dr. Hessa to us in the workshop. Dr. Hessa Aluyayan is an assistant professor of finance at Kuwait University. She was one of the 29 authors who published Before It Is Too Late, a white paper to influence economic policies in Kuwait. Her research interests 
to include behavioral finance and GCC fiscal. Her presentation is entitled, Before It's Too Late, A Vision to Reform the Kuwaiti Economy. Thank you very much, Dr. Hesse, for being with us. And I'd kindly like to ask you to please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Frank, for the introduction. It's my pleasure today to join this group of um, distinguished experts to address the diversification uh, efforts in um, the GCC. The current state of Kuwait economy is unsustainable. The privileges that generations of Kuwait have grown accustomed to since the discovery of oil are under threat of extension. Its inventable downfall and looming economic slump are difficult to predict as it has been exhilarated by amalgamations of reasons. Among them are the local demographic changes, regional and international geopolitical tensions, the global shift away from hydrocarbon energies towards clean and renewable energies, the sporadic shocks in recent years, such as the global financial crisis in 2018, the collapse of oil prices in 2015, and the ongoing COVID pandemic. All of which raise the prospect of an economic catastrophe that will lead to a radical and permanent change in the lives of Kuwaitis, their relationship with the states, and their reassurance for the well being of future generations. Kuwait is at a critical juncture that requires a national dialogue between economic decision makers, business people, scientific researchers, and the general public. We are a group of young academics specialized in economics and business from the College of Business Administration, Kuwait University, aim to contribute to the dialogue from a new and alternative perspective. We present before it's too late vision to reform the current economic trajectory. So we aim to draw the attention of citizens, business community, economic decision makers, and the executive in the legislative branches to an indisputable fact, which is the sustainability of the welfare state for future generations is not possible without sacrifice and concessions made by our current generation. It's critical we implement serious reforms before it's too late. In the vision, we highlighted five structural imbalances, and then we highlighted pillars and paths to reforms. Today, I will highlight the main structural imbalances, and my colleague Nawaf al-Abdeljadir will cover the pillars and paths to reforms tomorrow. The first imbalance we highlighted in the vision is the heavy dependence on oil revenue. Among the GCC countries, Kuwait is the most dependent on oil revenue. 90% of the budget revenues come from oil, compared to a low of 62% in Bahrain and a high of 75% in Qatar. The heavy dependence makes Kuwait prone to the inherent volatility to commodity market, thus causes fiscal imbalances and political tensions. This heavy dependence on oil over the years made the government wealthy and able to distribute this easy earned wealth, oil rents in the form of public jobs. Which brings us to the second imbalance, the imbalance in the labor market. The government employs about 84% of Kuwaitis in the government sector, which is the highest in the GCC. The ratio reflects Kuwaiti's outsized public sector and its inefficiency that ultimately results in more pressure placed on the public finance through increased spending on salaries. The relatively inflated wages in the public sector, the relaxed hours contribute to the reluctance of Kuwaitis to work in the private sector. This brings us to the third imbalance, which is the demographic imbalance. As I have mentioned, most Kuwaitis prefer to work in the public sector. 
leaving the private sector with no option but to hire foreigners. At the same time, the state continues to facilitate private sector's reliance on foreign workers by bearing part of their costs through subsidizing healthcare, fuel, electricity, and water consumption. The wage gap between public and private sector and between Kuwaitis and non-Kuwaitis, in addition to the weak educational outcomes that lowers the competitiveness of Kuwaitis worker, are all factors that contribute to the demographic imbalance in the population. Today, for every 25 workers in the private sector in Kuwait, one is only Kuwaiti and 24 are foreigners. Kuwaitis represent only one quarter of the population. This demographic imbalance is abnormal, unsustainable, and requires immediate reform. The previous imbalances that I have mentioned lead us to the fourth imbalance, which is the imbalance in public finances. Since the meltdown in oil prices in 2015, Kuwait budget consistently ended in a deficit. The total accumulated deficit over the seven years period is $100 billion. Expenditures continue to exceed revenues and no serious measures have been put in place to close this gap. This gap is expected to widen as a result of growing population and a populist parliament that refuse issuing public debt, imposing taxes, reforming subsidies and executing privatization. It has been challenging for the government to promote unpopular policies and reforms. Time is no longer a luxury. The government must announce and promote their fiscal reform plans and then firmly execute them before it's too late. The fifth and last imbalance is the weak education system specifically high spending by the government and low scores by students. The imbalance in the labor market discussed earlier highlights the importance of the educational system, which is relied upon to provide the necessary human capital for the workforce. Based on the trends in the International Mathematics and Science Study, TIMS test, Kuwaiti's scores declined between the years of 2011 and 2015, and its fourth grade students were at the bottom of the list among their Gulf peers. Kuwaitis were also the weakest in the Gulf in the 2016 Progress International Reading Literacy Studies PRILS test. These results didn't improve in high your grade levels as eighth grade results followed the same trajectory. Government continues to spend more on education while scores continue to decline, creating inefficiencies and imbalance in the labor market. The efforts to foster diversification taken by Kuwait government compared to the rest of the GCC have been limited and thus have failed to generate significant revenues which can support government spending over the long run, especially given the constant turbulence in energy markets and the increasing burden of demographic drag and the five imbalances I have highlighted today. Despite the imbalances and challenges, Kuwait have great opportunities to start reform. Kuwait has a balanced foreign policy and open to big markets like Iran, Al Iraq, and Saudi. Kuwait has a constitution, independent judicial system, established institutions, and mature legislative infrastructure. Freedom of speech is relatively high compared to other countries in the MENA, which enables a national dialogue on the best way to move forward to a more sustainable future. Seizing the aforementioned opportunities and putting Kuwait on the path to reform must start sooner rather than later. The treatment of Kuwait's structural imbalances must start now 
while popular support can be cultivated and difficult decision justified for a prosperous future. My colleague Nawaf Abdul Jader, as I mentioned, will discuss the necessary pillars and paths to reform uh, tomorrow. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Hessa. We appreciate your input. And I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Hatim, Dr. Hatim Al-Shanfari to us, which is, who is uh, giving us the second presentation. Dr. Hatim Al-Shanfari has diverse experience that spans academia, business, and civil society in Oman. He is currently a faculty member in the Department of Economics and Finance at Sultan Qaboos University and board member of the Musket Stock Exchange. Hatim's previous experience included a member of the Board of Governors of the Central Bank of Oman, board member of Oman Chamber of Commerce and Industry, vice chairman of Omani Economic Association. He served in the boards of a number of listed companies and investment funds. Dr. Hatim, it's a pleasure having you, please. Second, I need to unmute myself. Uh, All good. Thank you so much. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Sorry for that. I thought I had myself All unmuted. Good. Thank you so much. Thank Dr. you, Frank, for your introduction. I appreciate Hessa's presentation, which will fill in very well with my uh, presentation. I have some uh, figures and uh, graphs. I hope to put the uh, challenges and opportunities in the context in the right context for this uh, purpose. So to start with, I would like to share with you this graph, which shows the fiscal sustainability of Oman and the rating history of Oman by uh, SMP and Moody's started in around the middle of the 90s. So you can see from the middle of the 90s, both uh, SMP and that is uh, colored in blue and uh, Moody's in orange has been above investment grades. And this has been enhanced, which indicates financial stability, which is the major focus of rating agencies for Oman, up to 2014, when we saw the start of the drop in oil prices. Since then, you can see in this graph, the gradual drop in the rating. And we can see in 2016, SMP has downgraded Oman below investable grades. And that was followed in 2018 by Moody's and since then it has been a continuous drop. This is mainly attributed to the fiscal sustainability of Oman, given the challenges that we had after the oil price drop in 2014. As we are aware, oil prices were hovering around 100 and more and it has drastically dropped and that has exposed all the countries in the Gulf and I have some figures to share with you. So by the end of 2019, we can see that SMP has rated Oman uh, double B with negative outlook in October 2019, and Moody's uh, in March 2019, BA1 negative outlook, and Fitch double B plus uh, stable outlook. This was up before the COVID 19 pandemic and the double uh, challenge that Oman has faced. And we can see in this table that the ratings of Oman was badly damaged in 2020 because of the further drop in oil prices as well as the COVID pandemic. And we can see that uh, Moody started the process of downgraded Oman and has downgraded Oman twice in 2020, in March 5th, as well as in June 23rd. Fitch downgraded Oman twice again on March 24th and August 17th. And SMP downgraded Oman twice in 2000. Uh, on March 27 and October 16. This was a clear indication how difficult the fiscal sustainability was in Oman in 2000. 
This is the year when His Majesty Sultan Qaboos late uh, has passed away and the new Sultan came in. And the new Sultan has faced this extraordinary challenge uh, that to stabilize the economy and to make sure that the fiscal side is sustainable in the long term. So with this background, uh, I would like to share with you some common issues that are among the GCC, starting with the reliance on oil and gas that uh, Hassa has mentioned in her presentation. So a quick background to this, we can see, as many of you are aware of it, based on the BB statistical review of the World Economic Outlook in 2020, these are the data for the end of 2019. We can see how the region is rich with the natural resources. The proven oil reserves in Saudi Arabia makes up around 17.2% of the global reserves. This can last up to 69 years. And for Kuwait, 5.9, that can last up to 93. When we drop down the list where Oman stands, Oman has only less than 1% of the global proven reserves. And if it continues to produce at the current rates, it's likely to last around 15 years. That's just an indication. It's not the full truth. Things will change and things has changed in the past, mainly based on prices and based on the technological uh, innovations in this industry. So uh, it's not necessarily going to be only 15, but at least this is one indication that we need to keep in mind. So Oman compared to its neighbor, it's extremely uh, unendowned like the other countries in the Gulf. Uh, with the story about the gas, we see the same thing. Qatar tops the list with the world reserves around 12.4%, and that can last at the current rate of production for about 139 years, followed by Saudi Arabia all the way to Oman. And again, the reserves from the global share for Oman in the natural gas, almost similar to what we saw in the crude oil, and again, at the rate of production that we have now, that can last us around 18 years, roughly. Uh, Bahrain was not there in the first list because it has less than 1%, less than, one, less than 0.1% of the global reserves. It barely made it for the gas. And again, Bahrain is a situation very close to Oman as far as its uh, uh, wealth of natural resources. So this is a constraint along with this constraint of limited resources for Oman and Bahrain, compared to other GCC states, we see the energy transition that can be illustrated here by the uh, BB Energy Outlook that was published in 2020. And this looks at the long-term trend of the share of the conventional energy resources that we have in Oman and in the Gulf states. And you can see here that the share of oil has been decreasing and will continue to decrease all the way to 2050, according to BP projection. Uh, natural gas has peaked and is likely to peak around uh, 2035 and start likely to reduce after that. And then the renewable energy that's likely to pick up and the uh, transition here that we'll see around uh, 2035, this could be earlier, this could be later, depending on the technology advance. And we can see that the renewable will take over. This has consequences on countries either with limited resources or with even abundant resources. The energy transition is a fact and it is seriously challenged for the region overall. And for Oman, it's much more so as well as in Bahrain. So with this background in mind, we can see the shocks, the in addition to the limited resources and to the energy transition, uh, oil prices, as we're all aware of, is extremely unstable. And that lack of stability in the oil prices lead, leads to major <clears throat> fluctuation in the price. And this fluctuation in the price, as you can see here, for four different period, this graph from BP does only show up to 2016 in the red line. I have extended it to 2020, and we can see that this current price where the oil price have started to drop from 2014 to 2016 is the longest, and still the outlook is not very clear. It will improve any time to the period before 2014. So uh, all these challenges, uh, again, plays a major role, and men Oman much more conscious 
and his, uh, the leadership of His Majesty much more determined to do something about it. I think Hassa has explained the situation in Kuwait very well. Here in Oman, uh, realizing the challenge and the uh, limited time that we have, His Majesty have taken very much bold steps and he is driving this process of transition in a very uh, determined way. So looking at what has been put in place, the government has put forward a medium term fiscal balance plan that starts from 2020 to 2024 for five years. There are two major objectives for this plan, to boost government and revenues and to control the expenditure, non-essential expenditure. And the aim of this is to achieve fiscal balance in 2024. There are mainly main five pillars for this program. The first one is to support the economic growth. The second one is to re revitalize the diversification of the government investment returns rationalize and improve the efficiency of the government spending. And the fourth one, establish and strength the social protection plan. And lastly, to raise the efficiency of the public financial management. Again, major steps. This has been implemented since 2020 and His Majesty has pushed for implementation on the ground. And we can see these are the steps that has been taking place on the ground first the implementation of VAT in April 2021. The government has said very clearly there's going to be a continuous and gradual lift of subsidies on electricity and water. And then the government has started to take steps, noticeable steps and significant steps to reduce the uh, expenditure as well as uh, to restructure government on enterprises and to make them more efficient and cost uh, uh, conscious and then the, for the first time in Oman has been announced that there will be an income tax targeted for 2022 and none other countries in the Gulf has announced this this is again a very uh, bold move uh, putting a date and uh, target for the income tax we are now uh, this will be the third major tax after the access tax the VAT and the income tax as you all aware it's not easy to implement, but at least there is a target and a, a time frame for the government to uh, pursue. And another major steps that the government has taken to control the cost is to introduce non-voluntarily early retirement for nationals who works mainly in the public sector and government-owned uh, companies uh, for those who have completed 30 years of service in the public sector and public enterprises have been asked to leave and they will be on retirement. This has been completed at the end of 2020. And obviously the benefit of that is going to come uh, for the years to come uh, where the wage bill that is very large is now being addressed and addressed head on. So again, uh, these more bold, uh, bold moves has been a feature of the new Sultan who is determined to set right uh, the challenges that is facing us. And obviously, even though these measures have been has been or have been in, uh, helping the government to enhance the revenues and to control the cost we are still out in the market internationally need to borrow to expand and to repay loans that has been accumulated either through uh, euro bonds or bridging loans and there's a lot that will be uh, uh, has to be met this year in 2021 this year oman requires about 10 billion dollars that can be divided between repayment of loan and refinancing of or financing of the budget deficit. This is a huge amount of money. And without these bold steps, the government would not have won the trust of the international investors and rating agencies. Uh, so the fruit has already been there on the ground felt because of these bold steps. And obviously this does not go without public resentment. And we have already seen some of that showing up hopefully that can be dealt with in a better communication program that the government can take forward. But at least, as I say, there is determination from the top to move forward and to be bold and to achieve results uh, as quickly as visible. Now, with these steps in place, let's see where Oman is going to look like in the next few years. And we can see from the IMF uh, statistics that we have here, 
we can see Oman compared to like, for example, where Hassa is coming from Kuwait and other GCC countries. So uh, we had a very high break even in the fiscal balance of $109 at the peak of the oil prices uh, in 2014 before the drop that had started. And gradually this has been reduced and significantly the result is showing off in 2021 and further improvement is likely to be in 2022. Uh, as we can see, Bahrain is worse off and the ability to adjust is probably less flexible than Oman. But if you compare to Saudi Arabia or for, for that reason for Kuwait, Kuwait is expected to be uh, higher than Oman in 2022. These are only projection at the moment. It depends very much where the oil prices are likely to go from 2021, which I expected to be around 60 plus or minus. But in 2022, unless the prices stays close to where we are, these numbers are likely to be changed uh, and changed either up or down, depending on where the oil price is likely to be. So as you can see, there is improvement. And I think the uh, medium term fiscal adjustment plan is definitely indicating positive results. The other two indicators that I would like to share with you here is the fiscal balance as a percent of GDP and the current account balance as a percent of GDP. Again, in 2020, the double shock that we have experienced, all the GCC except in the case of Qatar and Kuwait have experienced negative uh, physical balance and Bahrain is the worst in that sense and followed by Oman. And the fact that the drop from 70 double digit, very high double digit to a single low digit is definitely an import, important indication. This is what Hissa is indicating with the case of Kuwait in 2021, the IMF expected that the Kuwaiti budget deficit to be in the range of almost 18%. That is extraordinarily high uh, compared to what we have experienced in the past. And this is quite serious. Going forward to 2022, we can see again, double digit. And obviously a country that goes through double digit, both on the fiscal side, as well as on the current account side, it's a very clear signal of the desperate situation of lack of financial stability and fiscal stability. So Oman, if it can carry on with its uh, attempt, there is a very good chance that we can go down to 1.5% of the GDP deficit. Likewise, for the current account deficit from very high double digit uh, of 10% to, and we can see the experience in 2017 to about 2.5. I'm conscious about time. This is my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention and i hope i had some i added some value to you thank you Thank you so much, dear Dr. Hatim. Uh, before we will continue with our third presentation, I would like to uh, introduce you to the Q&A uh, uh, session uh, that we have uh, after the fourth presentation. So if there is any comments, if there is any questions that you like to have addressed by the panelists, uh, please put them in the Q&A and uh, we will be happy to address those after the fourth presentation. Now, with regards to continuing with the presentations, I would like to introduce Ms. Noura Al-Lahu. Uh, she will be presenting a topic called the role of the private sector in economic diversification. Ms. Noura Al-Lahu is currently working as section head of the investment department at al Ahlea Insurance Company and Vice Chairman of the Economic Forum in the Kuwait Economic Society. Noura holds bachelor's degree in business management from Greenwich University in the United Kingdom in 2011. She is certified as money coach from the United States in 2018 and recently Noura holds a license and certification in international cross-cultural protocol from the United Kingdom. So Ms. Noura, please, thank you for being with us. I kindly like to ask you to start. Mr. Al-Khair, Jamian. 
شكرا على اتاحه الفرصه ويلكم اند ثانك يو فور allowing me the opportunity I would like to speak uh, uh, about the role of the private sector. Unfortunately, I informed you rather late. It's my honor also to recognize Dr. Hassa. I'll share the screen now with the presentation. I'll be speaking about the role of women, in fact, in the private sector, and I'll deal with two main themes. First of all, the role of the private sector in the state, and secondly, the role of women in economic development through the private sector. The private sector plays a main uh, and pivotal role in the economic development of the country through its uh, active participation in uh, uh, raising the growth rates and minimizing poverty. And that is through initiatives and risk taking, also through uh, reviving the economy through innovation to maintain um, maintain the basis of competitiveness. Also, the private sector in Kuwait forms 27% of the GDP. And the strategy implemented in this regard relies on improving the working business environment, provide funding for both private and public sectors. These are very important, of course, for increasing the importance of the role played by the private sector. I'm sorry that I made a mistake in the in the in this slides. Also, the in Kuwait, as we said, the private sector constitutes twenty seven percent of the GDP. Now I'll move to the second theme, and that is the role of women in achieving economic development through the private sector in Kuwait. It's worth mentioning that uh, women It's worth mentioning that women form 50% of the population out of 1.3 million as told the total population of the country. This study shows, or this statistic shows the population estimates of Kuwait by age group, nationality and gender in the public sector. And the, and the total population of 1.3 million, as we said. And as Dr. Hissa has said, that uh, the people's uh, willingness to work for the public sector forces many of the expat community members to work for the private sector. And the total population is 4 million, 1.3 million are native Kuwaitis. This slide shows the number of uh, females working in the public sector from 2012 to 2020. I use this slide to show how over a period of uh, 10 years, we see an increase in the number of uh, women working in the public sector. This is due to many reasons. 
chiefly among those is the fact that the public sector provides women the ability to reconcile between having job security, a permanent job, and also a family taking care of their families. In the private sector, there is a general lack of willingness to employ women despite the legislation because it's difficult for women to coordinate their life requirements between their family needs and work needs. So therefore, the productivity, this may not be true to a large extent, but this is the prevailing attitude that women are not uh, uh, that serious compared to men when, when it comes to work. Uh, in, in fact, this statistic shows the number of Kuwaiti females working in the private sector. This slide shows the difference between the female members in public and private sectors in Kuwait. Women and the national GDP, as it's known that the GDP is an indicator of measuring the economy of any state and I, it is a complete tool in this uh, the, the, to measure the productivity of a state. Like in Kuwait's GDP from 2012 to 2020, we see that uh, uh, in 2020, the GDP has gone down because of the pandemic. This is the part of my study where I want to link the GDP with the effect of Kuwaiti females working in public and private sectors and the predictions to the GDP between 2021 to 2025. The blue line is the trend in actual uh, reality and the dotted line is the estimated trend. And we see how both trends are coinciding here. And this shows the attitude of women regarding moving to the private sector. In the private sector, when we go down, the middle line here represents the role of women in the private sector. In the first section, this is the role of women in the public sector, and the estimation is, is matching reality and the actual trend. The second section represents the situation of women in the private sector, and as we said, the role of the private sector is uh, very simple. It only forms 27% of the GDP, and therefore the employment opportunities are not vastly available because um, our brothers and sisters from the expat community are already occupying this job opportunity, so therefore Lately, there's no room for more people to be employed in the private sector. The forecast from 2021 to 2025 is based on the current uh, considerations. We see the public sector witnessing an increase, although in the private sector we see if the trend line is rather flat and there is no growth. And the shadow which is presented here represents the peak and the bottom 
the, and the, both private sector and public sector will not exceed this peak or bottom according to the figures we have and the behavior of, of the government's uh, um, uh, trend in continuing to employ uh, women or Kuwaiti citizens in the public sector. And therefore, their lack of willingness to approach the private sector. Women need a lot of uh, uh, new laws and legislation to create a balance between her life, their lives at home and the family needs and the, the, the also employment needs. And I tried to conduct a simple experiment. These figures are not realistic and they're not actual. I, I asked a company uh, which engages in consultancy work, I asked them to see how we can transfer 70,000 women from the private, from the public sector to the private sector to see what estimated effect that will have on the GDP. And as a result of this experiment, when we try to move this number 70,000 to the private sector, we saw a growth in the rate of and the presence of women in the private sector. And we also deliberately try to estimate that uh, uh, each year, this number will be increased by 5,000 or 10,000 and see what impact will this have on the GDP. Uh, honestly speaking, we see the number here on the increase and this shows that uh, women are always uh, active and so far as the economy is concerned and uh, we should not ignore women and we should always provide them with the right uh, environment uh, at the private sector in the private sector finally we must say that uh, participation of the private sector in the economy of the country should increase and this will not happen unless we shrink the structure of the public sector, also through supporting women, empowering them in the private sector through legislation, which can allow for women to reconcile between their family needs and work needs and not to make the private sector feel disadvantaged here. Also, we should allow women to work from home to enable them more to balance between their family life and work life. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. I would, now allow, I would now like to ask Mr. Oliver Ooms to share his thoughts with us. And I would quickly like to introduce uh, Mr. Oliver before he starts his part. Mr. Oliver Ooms is the CEO of the German Emirati Joint Council for Industry and Commerce. He served in early 2000 as the regional manager for the German African Business Association. In early 2009, Oliver moved to Jakarta, where he was tasked to develop a new service unit in the, in the National Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Jakarta. While he was in Jakarta, he was by Gesellschaft für internationale Zusammenarbeit for promoting a program of regional economic development. In 2016, he was appointed by the Association of German Chambers of Commerce and Industry as the delegate of German industry and commerce for Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Yemen. Mr. Oliver, please, your presentation or your contribution is uh, titled FDI Attraction, Industrialization and SME. I would kindly like to ask you to please start. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. And uh, my apologies for not having 
uh, such an impressive presentation as the, the other three ones that I had the pleasure to witness. It's uh, also a great honor to be part of this illustrious panel of uh, academicians and with um, uh, humility, I have to say, I'm just an ordinary business guy. Therefore, please accept uh, my apologies in case uh, my statements or my thesis are um, less academic as uh, they should be. Nevertheless, uh, we have, uh, um, we have uh, proposed uh, a short uh, paper that has been written by one of my colleagues and myself on uh, the contribution of uh, German companies to uh, the topic of uh, today's and tomorrow's conference. Also, we have been describing very briefly where we would see opportunities and uh, where um, the German, <coughs> sorry, the German industry, German companies, especially small and medium-sized companies would also identify some uh, pain points. Um, I would like uh, to briefly um, highlight some of the main topics, points, concerns, however you want to call it from this document. Um, from the brief uh, presentation, given by um, our moderator, you know that uh, I have uh, been uh, able uh, to live here in the region for a couple of years now. And it just occurred to me that uh, I have been professionally in charge for the whole GCC region, which uh, um, just uh, came across my mind. Um, today, I, due to my function as being the CEO of the German Emirati Joint Council of Industry and Commerce, I'm in the position to talk more specifically about developments in the following GCC countries, obviously the UAE, and Kuwait, Oman, and Qatar. These are the four GCC countries I'm in charge of right now, in addition to my function as the delegate of German industry in Iraq. But in the past, until mid-2019, as I was posted in the same function in Saudi Arabia, I also still have a little bit of knowledge of uh, what uh, is happening and especially what has been uh, going on in terms of economic diversification in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Therefore, without uh, being officially in the position to comment on developments in KSA, um, wherever this is suitable, I'm happy to comment on this further. So um, why does diversification matter for German companies? And uh, um, secondly, why do German companies matter at all to this discussion of uh, today's and tomorrow's conference? Well, first of all, um, German companies uh, have had a long history here in the region as investors, not only as exporters, but also as investors in uh, especially the larger GCC member countries. Uh, I mentioned uh, that I was posted in Riyadh before moving to uh, the UAE. Um, I had the pleasure to uh, um, celebrate the 40th anniversary of our office, the German Chamber Organization, back in Riyadh. As back in 1978 already, this office has been established as one of uh, the first German Chamber offices abroad in the MENA region. Um, our portfolio here in the UAE is uh, much younger. I think it was in 1999 that um, we started with a small office in Dubai and another small office in Abu Dhabi. And uh, a bit more than 10 years ago, these two offices were not only merged, but they also um, turned into a full-fledged, if I may say so, bilateral chamber of commerce and industry. And right now we have the pleasure of representing 450 corporate members, mainly here in the UAE. So you can see here, if we just play by the numbers, um, the German engagement portfolio is quite significant here in the UAE altogether. And we estimate, we guesstimate that we have roughly 1,000 German companies operating here in the UAE, which means uh, re having real business operations on the ground um, certainly, the uh, seen from a legal perspective, the number of German entities, uh, entities sorry, might be uh, much higher. Um, the second largest German portfolio, um, that's not a big surprise, is in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. When I left, uh, I remember we were um, estimating that some 200 German companies have a presence on the ground in the Kingdom. This uh, definitely has been increasing in the meantime. And then respectively, in the, if I may say so, with all due respect, the smaller GCC countries, the German portfolio, the German engagement is uh, significantly smaller, I have to say. So not a big surprise. 
we can see uh, the significant uh, hub function, especially the Emirate of Dubai is uh, playing for German industry. And uh, by the way, but this is not the topic of today's discussion. Um, this hub has been uh, reaching out to a growing and a, a larger a region than uh, this has been the case five or even 10 years ago, as most of our member companies are supervising, if I may say so, or developing um, German opportunities, German markets in Africa, if I may call it uh, in the West of the GCC, and then partly in Afghanistan and Pakistan in the East. So the portfolio of German companies is quite significant. What are they doing? And uh, that's a little bit um, the downside, so to say, of my narrative. Most companies are here with uh, a service mission. Services uh, meaning a trade, yes, wholesale business, especially in the UAE. Services does also include after sales services, consultancy, um, especially IT services, uh, but also business and management consultancy. And then, unfortunately, certainly from your perspective, to a much lesser extent, uh, it includes manufacturing um, activities or any other kind of uh, um, local value added services. Um, for um, talking about the reasons why, let's say, the manufacturing presence is not more impressive, I will do uh, in the second part of my presentation. So my first thesis would be German companies, first of all, have a strong presence here in the region. They contribute significantly to economic development. We can argue if uh, the German portfolio is the largest European or the second or the third largest. This definitely is, uh, varies from country to country, but the bottom line is uh, the German presence, especially seen from uh, the European or EU perspective, is uh, remarkable. Um, secondly, and obviously this goes hand in hand, also, German exports uh, are quite significant to the region, um, the GCC region, and this is a uh, not very known fact, is the fifth largest German export market outside of the European Union. So number five outside of the European Union, of course, you can imagine uh, number one, number two are China and US, then we have Japan, and um, if I remember well, Korea is number four, and then immediately the GCC. So it also matters for Germany. And this uh, then already um, leads me to my second point, diversification here in the region matters for us, if I may say so. The more um, sectors are developed, especially um, I'm talking about uh, local value addition in different manufacturing industries. Let's talk about uh, processing food, um, uh, developing downstream value chains talking about light manufacturing, engineering activities in all these ventures, developments, so not in all, but in many of these uh, German know-how, to use a very general phrase or term, is needed. And uh, very quickly then, German companies will be part of these uh, development processes. Opportunities. We see that uh, besides uh, the mentioned sectors, um, a very strongly emerging opportunity we see in the topic of hydrogen. Um, this is also um, one of um, the um, paragraphs in our document, in our paper, um, talking about hydrogen. This is uh, not a new technology, actually technology-wise or seen from a technical engineering perspective. It's a very well-established technology, which uh, has um, reached a certain level of technological maturity um, or has had uh, and developed such a level of maturity for many decades. But uh, in the course of uh, the very recent few years, and here we are talking about uh, two to three years, um, it uh, is became common sense uh, that a new significant market, not at least in Germany, for hydrogen um, is developing, is emerging, and especially considering um, the aim of Germany to um, turn towards a more sustainable non-fossil energy sources. We are talking as Germans of uh, green hydrogen, um, um, in some cases of blue hydrogen, which is the one uh, being uh, driven or um, 
so to say, developed by, by natural gas. So here we see a huge opportunity. Um, this is supported not only by German know-how, but also um, purchasing commitment. And on the other side, we um, see the undisputed potential of um, especially Saudi Arabia, the UAE, to uh, utilize their significant um, potentials of uh, providing um, renewable energy, which is needed in large quantities to um, produce green or slash blue hydrogen. Talking about, um, so to say, the obstacles of uh, um, a more deeper, first of all, but also more um, integrated regional engagement of uh, German companies here in the Gulf region. I've mentioned uh, the hub function of the UAE, and we also see some uh, local value addition of German companies in the different free zones. We also have a couple of manufacturing entities and to a much, much lesser degree in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, one can imagine that uh, this has uh, led to political reactions, uh, claims towards uh, um, German potential investors. And um, you might have heard or seen and witnessed uh, recent statements of uh, high level um, Saudi officials claiming that uh, under certain conditions, international investors will need to establish regional headquarters in the kingdom starting from 2024. So we see uh, obviously that uh, there is political pressure, economic pressure in Saudi, but political pressure is exerted on international investors. Um, we would argue that a much deeper and more sophisticated regional integration would be beneficial for international investors and especially for small and medium-sized companies. And uh, this is um, especially one point our paper is elaborating upon. Um, what is, it, what is uh, in our eyes um, hampering, so to say, a much deeper uh, regional integration. First of all, um, we are lacking um, a more harmonized system of technical standards. Um, we have uh, certain bodies, institutions um, like uh, GSO, the Gulf Standardization Organization, which are aiming at uh, harmonizing technical standards across the Gulf sites, but Effectively, we know that the national standardization bodies in Saudi Arabia, as well as in Kuwait or in the UAE, is uh, um, still proceeding with its uh, national standards. And also here, the devil is in the details. We know, for instance, from um, manufacturers of uh, automotive parts, of spare parts for the after sales market, that accessing um, with these parts, these spare parts, to the six GCC states is burdensome and worrisome. And uh, at the end of the day, ham hampers also um, seeing um, the region as an entity, economic entity, and developing the region as an e economic entity. The second point uh, that I would like to make is about uh, national content requirements. Um, some of you might be familiar with the national content programs, for instance, in Saudi Arabia, it's called Kiva, IKTVA. Here in the UAE, it's called ICV, and I guess in Oman, it has uh, a very similar abbreviation. In short, uh, these um, programs are aiming at uh, um, convincing international suppliers, especially to the well-known oil companies, to um, develop certain local value addition by various means. Um, this is all uh, understandable, meaningful, and uh, absolutely justified seen from a political perspective. On the other side, we would um, urge national decision makers to um, work out on a system of mutual recognition of these national standards, considering the individual size of each market so that uh, one company which qualifies for instance for PDO in Oman at the same time also without further ado then qualifies as international supplier to Adnok or to Aramco in Saudi Arabia. This would uh, significantly um, support the efforts of small and medium-sized companies and especially of the ones which are investing 
here locally. So that's a topic that we have been uh, discussing with our membership, but also our um, various political partners over the last couple of years. Uh, but uh, it is indeed um, hampering um, until now, I have to say, um, stronger investment, especially of small and medium-sized companies here in the individual GCC states. The last point that I would like to make, I'm looking also at the time, um, are the national employment programs. I'm very grateful for the contributions of uh, my previous uh, female speakers in both cases, Hessa and Nura. Um, um, we have been uh, hearing uh, some aspects with regards to quotization, and you all know that we have very similar programs, um, especially in Saudi Arabia and uh, in Oman, and to a certain extent also here in the UAE. Um, what we would like to uh, um, support, to urge, yes, but also to support local decision makers is uh, to see greater efforts in uh, training local um, um, young uh, professionals, graduates with the respective skills which are needed, uh, not only in German companies, but also for international com companies per se. Uh, it's uh, something that uh, we have been observing in the last couple of years in Saudi Arabia. There's a very strong push now towards humanization in Oman as well. Um, this is politically understandable and again, also completely justified considering the high rate of uh, youth unemployment. On the other side, um, somebody, let's say, assembling car spare parts uh, or even uh, selling uh, um, a ride quality and also expensive product like a German car. This requires uh, specific skills and it's not a great uh, surprise that uh, looking into the German um, history of technical and vocational training and education that uh, um, our German young professionals go through a three year long professional training, public private training uh, until they are finally, so to say, released onto the labor market. Um, it's a very successful program, which requires time and effort, yes, and also a little bit of money by the different parties. But it's something that we would like um, to see to be developed uh, more dynamically in the individual GCC states as um, having uh, well-skilled um, youngsters, if I may say so, for the very specific um, requirements provided by German employers or European international employers. This is something that uh, we definitely would like to support. So maybe I should stop here and uh, turn back to our moderator, Frank Himpel. Please uh, unmute yourself. Thank you so much, Oliver, for your presentation. We appreciate it. And thank you so much to all the four panelists for today's first session. Uh, at this point, I would like to also uh, say thank you to all the honorable guests that we had on social media and we received a question uh, from Ala Murad. Thank you so much for this that I would like to forward to Dr. Hessa as uh, she was talking about the high dependency on oil. Um, Hessa, the question uh, that Ala Murad via social media was asking us is what are the alternatives of oil after its depletion. So maybe you could start addressing this, this question from Ala Murad and then perhaps uh, our colleagues can, can add to this. Hessa, please. Thank you, Ala, for uh, the question. Uh, in Kuwait currently, there is no clear program of how to diversify the economy away from oil. They talk about um, hydrocarbon industries, they talk about, you know, tourism, but there is no clear, clear plan like the other of the GCC countries. Plus, there is a lot of competition between Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait, now Iraq, on everyone have the same idea on how to move forward. But the good thing about Kuwait, which is, I think, is the greatest competitive advantage that ever happened to Kuwait, is that we have a foreign um, reserves, which is the assets are somewhere between 600 to 700 billion dollars. It was established in 1953. 
their revenues on those assets don't feed into the budget. So it keeps growing a year over year. And um, we believe that this fund shouldn't be tapped until serious reforms have been done. If they start withdrawing money too early from the foreign um, assets, then the chances that they would deplete quicker would be high. So this is one thing that as an alternative to um, the oil revenues currently feeding into the budget. Um, personally, I think that um, they could focus on certain industries that Kuwaiti's company have proved to be competitive at. And we don't have to be uh, all over the place in terms of industry. I think it's fine to focus on one or two industries. We have successful companies in Kuwait like Zain Telecommunication that spread it all over the um, region. We have uh, an agility that has offices all over the world. So empowering those companies and empowering the true entrepreneurs who are, who are adding uh, creative products to um, the world should be taken seriously um, to move forward because those companies will eventually produce revenues and taxes that would feed into the uh, uh, budget. Thank you so much, Dr. Hessa. We have uh, Dr. Elias Khalil. You like to you you raised your hand, and I would like to give the word to you. Yes, uh, thank you all for uh, very. Uh, useful and uh, I learned a great deal and this is really a very important topic uh, for the region about diversification. Uh, my uh, question is uh, to Hassa again and uh, that is uh, uh, the point is that it's not sufficient that the government's budget is not uh, greatly based on all revenues. Uh, so the all revenues could really be reduced all the way to 50% and 50% non all revenues. But that's not really a, a good indication that uh, uh, that Kuwait or other, for that matter, other countries in the uh, in the region is uh, independent of oil. And the reason is that if the uh, uh, let's say that the, an industry like in telecommunication arises, but this telecommunication depends on people who are, in the final analysis, depending on all revenues. Uh, you could have uh, some kind of industries like petrochemicals, but they are again uh, really uh, depending on, um, on uh, the uh, production of oil. So what is really, uh, what is needed is the kind of, um, what we, uh, in economics, I'm an economist, we call it general equilibrium uh, model, trying to differentiate among industries uh, according to really the, um, the source of productivity. Um, uh, there are some uh, line of uh, commodities and goods that whose production and refinement and, uh, and, and amplification and throughout the economy is still within one industry, but there could be a totally independent source of uh, innovation and productivity uh, that really uh, could, uh, are for, a, for a huge country could be uh, many, many different sources, not just one, uh, uh, one source. So this is really important in the diversification to distinguish between uh, primary and secondary industries. Secondary industries could be spin off from the primary industry. So that really uh, what really wa what is needed for diversification is to have uh, more than one primary industry or one uh, uh, fundamental uh, source of, uh, 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 of, um, uh, of revenue. And thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Elias. Elias, for your comment, if I may. Yeah, I, I do believe with you about uh, segmenting the industries to primary and secondary. Um, so Kuwait do really need to sit down and figure out where they can compete the most. And is it the green uh, hydrogen industry moving forward because of renewables? Is it 
tourism? Is it education? Is it healthcare? At this point, we really don't know where our competitive advantage is as a country. And um, the, we, you probably have heard about the SME fund, the large fund that support SMEs. It seems that um, they're trying to encourage small businesses to compete and the majority probably of the businesses are in the restaurant business. Um, so there's no clear primary industries other than the foreign investments and the oil right now. They need to work on it. Thank you. Thank you, Hessa. Now we have a, a hand by uh, Dr. Atam Al Said. Uh, Dr. Atam, I kindly like to ask you to raise your point, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Frank. And uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Hassa, I came in a bit late uh, on your presentation, but I think you've mirrored a lot of our concerns in GCC countries, and I see a lot of parallels. And I'd like to give a shout out for Dr. Hatem as well, my colleague, uh, as well for that analysis on the Omani economy and uh, Ms. Noura and Oliver as well. Uh, just a couple of questions. I haven't heard the complete story in Kuwait, but I've been looking at the GCC closely for a while and I see a lot of parallels. But uh, my comment on the Kuwait experience from an outside view is probably one where there was, uh, this was Oman about 20 years ago. In the, in the sense of economic structure. And one of the challenges, a point made by Elias is a good one, but an extremely difficult one to build on. But I think we need to be uh, sort of focused on what do you mean by diversification of government revenues and budgets and fiscal uh, points that uh, Dr. Hatem has raised or the economic diversification. And this, this kind of, it, it's both a dichotomy and it isn't at the same time for the academics in listening because one is definitely related to the other in the GCC, but for a sustainability point, uh, governments can have deficits, but the economy can run reasonably well. And then it's about whether you use this policy or that policy to maintain economic activity. Uh, so I think we need to talk about decoupling GCC economies from dependence on uh, hydrocarbons, because much of the diversification here in Oman and in our sister countries in the GCC has been more of downstream petrochemicals, which, back to the point of Elias, is highly dependent on the same industry. So any shocks in one industry may not very well uh, reverberate positively or negatively. It depends on the outcomes. So that's one particular point I'd like to raise. The other one, which I found interesting in Noura's uh, sort of presentation, um, there, there are definitely similar issues in Kuwait and in Oman on women's employment in the private sector. But I was curious, even as an exercise, which I find very interesting, you suggested that women's movement from public to private may have positive impact, regardless of what the working conditions are. And I wonder if that is an assumption that women are more productive, generally speaking, and they're able to uh, outdo their male counterparts in work and, and they're able to give more because definitely in education, women uh, do better, especially here in Oman, than male uh, do, uh, higher education specifically. So I'm curious about that. And I, I like the points raised by Oliver as well. Um, you've, you've touched upon a lot of points that are very important to us as foreign investors come and invest in our countries. But one of the things that kind of, sort of you've pointed out that most of the German companies tend to be in the retail and services. Um, is that because these sectors are more accessible in your experience or there is a bit of risk aversion in the productive side of the economy and manufacturing and high sort of R&D development spending there? I'd also like to hear your thoughts as well. And, and again, sorry, uh, moderator, for taking a bit longer in my questions. All good, Your Highness. Thank you. So I would like to raise those points to the panelists, please. Ladies first, otherwise uh, I'm happy to start. Um, no one up. Thank Answer, you. Please. I'm, I, I'm not too sure if you addressed a question to me or rather just a comment uh, at home. Yeah, it was more of sharing 
uh, sort of uh, cross-reference between Oman and Kuwait. But, you know, any insight or thoughts, at least, that, you know, I'll be happy to discuss even later, if you'd like, Dr. Sure, thank you. I'll leave it to Nora, then, to answer your uh, question about productivity and women in the private sector. I'm sorry, uh, regarding the productivity, in uh, المرأة تنجز حالة حالة الرجل في العمل سواء في القطاع الحكومي أو في القطاع الخاص. Women are as productive as men, whether it is in the private or public sectors. But in the public sector, uh, men are more empowered compared to women, and the private sector does not tend to recruit women. So law, the law gives women more uh, rights. So this makes the private sector not willing to uh, recruit uh, women. So these rights have become something that is against women themselves. So here I'm talking about uh, the uh, employment uh, uh, ladder of employment or scale of employment that is available. We still do not have uh, uh, women in leadership position. So that is why we have the same method, which is empowering more men than women, because they think that uh, uh, women would not tend to uh, go to work as much as men do. So I hope my answer was useful. Thank you. Shukran. So I think uh, I'm the next one. Um, well, I'm happy that uh, the topic of comparative, uh, comparative advantages uh, has been uh, brought up because uh, this is uh, part of the answer to um, the question of, of uh, Mr. Adham. Um, but there's another point that I sh certainly should have highlighted uh, um, um, better or stronger in my, my initial statement. It's a topic of market size. And uh, this is why I have been uh, um, pitching, so to say, for the idea of uh, a stronger or deeper regional integration. Uh, it doesn't matter if you talk to one of the big chemical giants uh, um, of German roots, or if you talk to a small and medium-sized companies, very quickly, if you challenge them and ask them, why don't you invest, uh, no matter if it's 1 million or 1 billion here in the GCC region, they will tell you that, um, the individual markets, with all due respect, also the, the market size of Saudi Arabia or the UAE um, does not justify um, such a significant investment. Um, it's also one lesson, I have to say, um, from the COVID uh, pandemic that we see uh, um, the German companies, and this is also true certainly for other European economies, are considering, um, and we have this famous word of uh, nearshoring, which means concentrating the international supply chains uh, stronger than this has been done in the past. Um, and uh, this, in many cases, means having a manufacturing uh, mother house, so to say, in the European Union, and then certainly a second base either in uh, East Asia and in North America. So there's a lot of uh, water and land in between, but it doesn't make it easier for um, those organizations um, trying to convince uh, international companies to, to invest here in the region. So it's a topic of market size. And uh, therefore, I would strongly uh, lobby in favor of uh, seeing the GCC as a single market, like we have it in the European Union, and also working on uh, those bottlenecks. And I have highlighted some which, uh, um, so to say, hinder um, uh, a deeper regional integration. But the second topic is, uh, and that's indeed a comparative uh, advantage which uh, I would like to see developed better is the topic of uh, the availability of skilled labor. If you look into the German machinery industry, for instance, mostly comprising of small and medium-sized companies with an average size of 200, 250 employees, every single employee matters. So Germany obviously is not uh, um, like one of the workbenches in Asia. But uh, here you have very specific skills, uh, not always university driven, but uh, in many cases, very um, long standing um, and uh, um, um, 
developed uh, technical skills in very specific uh, professions. This is something that we are still lacking here in the region. Of course, you can argue that this, this is an expertise or these are skills that uh, might be imported uh, from other countries, notably also from South Asia, but uh, I understand that's exactly not the model that we should be pursuing here in the Gulf region. So therefore, um, talking about comparative advantages, um, I remember on the statement previously made by Hessa. I think that's something where we need to spend a, a second thought on what are the individual comparative advantages of the, um, of the Gulf states. Uh, in some cases, it's uh, the attractiveness of the market in Saudi Arabia, where you also have a, a very young and dynamic uh, workforce. But then uh, looking into uh, um, a little bit smaller Gulf countries, I think uh, we have to uh, um, spend a second and a third uh, thought on such an important topic. Thank you, Oliver. I think with, with regards to the time, we are still good. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, you raise your hand. Uh, I, I have two questions actually, uh, one for Dr. Hatem and one for uh, Dr. Hesa. For Dr. Hatem, uh, can you address the, the measures that the government took in, um, concerning um, um, uh, fiscal policies? Uh, but can you, can you um, elaborate a little on, on the situation of the FDI in Oman? Um, and for Dr. Hesa, I have another question. What measures the government took to address those structural uh, imbalance in, in, in Kuwaiti economies? Thank you. Shall we start with Hesa? Please. Hi, so um, in terms of Kuwait government, um, the parliament was elected last uh, November and uh, they have, the government have shared the program that they intend to do over the next four years. And uh, it's just uh, words on um, it lacks target, it lacks time frame. As uh, Dr. Hat mentioned, uh, the Omani experience is more organized. They have their targets, they have their time frames. But it seems that some of the what, what would they intend to do is basically um, VAT taxes, reform some of the subsidies. Uh, they want to reform the education system. They, they, they do what they're proposing overlaps with some of the imbalances I have highlighted today and what will uh, my colleague Nawaf cover tomorrow. But um, it's just, it, it's in an infancy state, um, not bold. And it needs the, the parliament approval for them to uh, pass. So it's a bit more tough in Kuwait because of um, the constitutional democracy, I'd say, uh, to implement things uh, quickly or quicker than the GCC countries. They do, the, G the rest of the GCC has the liberty of moving quicker compared to Kuwait. Thank you. Thank you, Hessa. Hatim, please. Yes, um, Hamad, regarding the FDA, uh, FDI in Oman, uh, it has been traditionally concentrated in the oil and gas sector. That's where you see a lot of flow from uh, multinationals who are interested to invest in the oil and gas sector. And uh, one of the issues related to FDA is the credit ratings. The credit ratings summarize the whole package of the risk associated with the country. And lately, as I showed you since 2014, this has been on the downward trend. This has not helped the uh, foreign investment to expand in Oman apart from the oil and gas sector and obviously the government is now looking at means and ways of attracting foreign investment mainly through the partnership public private partnership and through privatization uh, program uh, lately they have been two large projects one is selling off the uh, utility company or the transmission company to a Chinese company about 49 percent this is one form of direct investment through uh, 
inviting foreign investors. There was again a sale of around 10% of uh, the government owned company in one of the major gas fields in Oman uh, that again have attracted quite a lot of money into Oman. But uh, since then, uh, the government has been now working very hard on trying to put many of these companies that are publicly owned to the uh, market, whether it is directly placing it as a first stage to foreign investors and strategic investors, and then to the public in the uh, stock exchange, uh, and to streamline these operations. Hopefully that can bring more interest. Uh, some of those infrastructure projects that we saw, for example, selling uh, the transmission tower for the telecommunication company uh, in Oman to uh, foreign investment, that's again into this direction. It's still not at a stage where we feel comfortable as a country, and, but there is a very much uh, deliberate move and consolidated move towards that, and hopefully that will bear fruit as we go forward. Thank you so much, Hatim. We appreciate it. And I have uh, one question uh, from my side that I would like to address to all the panelists and to those uh, who are joining us uh, today on the Zoom session. And this is that uh, I would like to explore a little bit the role of education. How can the education support uh, diversification? So in other words, we have uh, different uh, university systems, education systems, um, and how can education as such support uh, the uh, efforts and the, uh, the process uh, towards increased diversification? Um, I would like to give this question to basically everyone in the Zoom to invite everyone uh, to be part of this if you just like to raise your hand. Otherwise, if I may, uh, I would like to start with Dr. Hatim. Uh, to, to go ahead, start this one, and then I'd like to ask all the other uh, distinguished guests of today's session to perhaps join in, in trying to address this question, the role of education um, in advancing diversification. Please, Dr. Yeah, to me, Yeah, to me, education is not just uh, at the higher uh, education level, but Hessa has pointed out some of the indications regarding the quality of education in different countries. Um, education is a key to help create a human capital development that is very critical, that has the uh, ability to adopt and to take advantage of opportunities. I guess one of the issues that are common across GCC is the weak education system, starting with the primary education all the way to the higher education. And even those who have educated, got educated either internally in these countries or outside with very high skills. Unfortunately, the work environment does not upgrade their skills. They tend to de-skill. So it's a whole ecosystem uh, that has a problem that we have to address because uh, governments invest extraordinary amount of money on, on education, but the impact of it is very limited. The attitude generally is uh, not very helpful in terms of uh, willing to do the work and to be competitive with uh, foreign uh, laborers who are working in the same country. So I think it's not just education per se, uh, even though there's a lot to be said there, but the overall cultural issues that has evolved over the years, where the public are just looking at the government as a mean to subsidize, to support, to provide business opportunities, and that's, uh, sorry, uh, to provide financial support and all this, this has not helped in the past. A culture needs to be changed, and we have to work very hard towards it. We have to start from the basic issues of education that we need to address. It is very critical. We see countries, for example, like Singapore, like uh, Korea, where education levels and training is very high. Uh, it has added to their ability to grow and to uh, create opportunities for their uh, populations. And that's what we are missing here is that uh, either education is limited to the few and that's not trickling down to the masses and the cultural issues that is associated with education need to be addressed. Uh, and that is going to be a long, a long process to uh, rectify. 
but I guess without the proper education, proper training, the ability to diversify in the GCC is going to be very limited. Thank you. Thank you, Hatim. Now, Dr. Atam. Thank you, uh, Frank, and thanks, Dr. Hatim, for that. I would disagree with Dr. Hatim uh, on a couple of things. Uh, I always like to do that, by the way. Um, the, we seem to bash education in the GCC often, but uh, from being involved in higher education, not only as a, an instructor and an active member in the academic environment to some extent, but also from the quality side, we've seen that we were able to, at least in Oman, uh, necessarily get the accreditation to recognize that some of those higher education institutions are on the right track. And, and education is a long-term investment as, as has been already mentioned. But what we've done incorrectly, and I'll refer back to Oliver's point here, is we focused on higher education rather than the skills and the vocational skills. So we've effectively uh, demoralized our youth when they go to vocational training as a last resort rather than the opposite. And in doing so, we've turned our attention outside the region to gain the skills or get the skills from the sort of abundant supply of labor and skilled labor for that matter. But when you come to look at statistics on what kind of people are we hiring out of the region, most of them are either illiterate or uh, sort of general diploma holders and very small percentage who are highly skilled and qualified. Meaning that there's structural problems in our private sector that tends to work on the low skill, cheaper version of development and acquiring that. So that's why we have many structural challenges in the labor market. So it's a knock on effect between labor market not signaling what kind of skills it needs and is not willing to invest, as Dr. Hatem had said, in their training, and depending on government to provide all of that. And much of the training we've had in Oman for the last few decades was really kind of trained for purpose and trained for a job rather than trained for life. And I think that is where our educational system, uh, I can speak at least for Oman, phases a gap between what are the real skills required and what are the sort of practical skills needed in, in the market. And to be honest, in our labor market, at least here in Oman, we, you can't talk to anyone who can tell you what skills. They will flag hard skills and soft skills. But to be honest, much of that isn't helping universities, colleges, uh, and programs to cater for what youth want. And the last point is, we don't have labor market informational systems that feed into education. So we talk STEM and we talk about all of these nice things, but how do we translate that into reality most of the time, I think the gap is huge between what the labor market wants and businesses and what education is providing. Um, so I would rather be somewhere in the middle and not judge education as being completely uh, useless. On a minor point, if you allow me, when we talk about spending on social services such as education, in Oman, about 85% of that spending is on manpower, on teachers. And the classical idea is if you train teachers well, you get good outcomes. It's not how much you pay them only, but how do you train them and upskill them to make sure the next generation is better skilled? Thank you, Atta. Oliver? Well, in principle, I agree uh, with uh, both uh, honorable speakers. Uh, first of all, I would agree um, with the uh, first statement by, made by Dr. Hatim concerning uh, the cultural um, factor, the cultural aspects. And again, I'm, I'm turning to my previous host country, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where um, there's such a strong need uh, of uh, identifying suitable jobs for the many, many young Saudis. And not everyone can create a, um, his or own startup. There's a fantastic startup community, don't get me wrong about that. But at the end of the day, you also need people which are wielding pipes which are taking a screwdriver into their hands and uh, which are sawing wood, for instance. And I do not yet see the readiness of uh, many young people to take on these jobs, first of all. And secondly, unfortunately, we also don't have the right educational system for that. And uh, I don't need to mention anyone, but there has been a very long engagement of uh, a well-known German state-owned uh, company, uh, which uh, after all, was not very successful, I have to admit, unfortunately. So there have been uh, very well-meant trials to implement these institutions and structures, 
uh, in the in case A, but obviously the approach was uh, not the right one. I'm less concerned with regards uh, to my current host countries, um, the, including the UAE, where I see, and uh, this is, uh, has been uh, a point made by Dr. Atten, that uh, the, the, the infrastructure, so to say, of higher education is quite remarkable and noteworthy in all the countries I have the pleasure to work in right now, from Kuwait, uh, ranging to Qatar, uh, UAE and Oman. Uh, we have the pleasure to meet uh, very well-skilled uh, young uh, local um, talents, which can be easily employed by the tech-driven German companies which are operating here in the region. But again, at the end of the day, you also need to have a technician which is fixing a machine, standing at the assembly line and then connecting cables with uh, engines, for instance. And uh, these very basic, don't get me wrong, uh, it's an honorable job, but these basic technical skills are not yet taught in local institutions. This is what I'm missing. Thank you, Oliver. Now, with regards to the time, I think we still have time for one more question that reached me in writing. Uh, the question goes out to Dr. Hatem, and I will read it to you. Um, it reached me here via the Zoom uh, Q&A function. It says, thank you all for the informative presentations. This is a question to Mr. Al Shanfari. Do you believe the omanization program is hindering the attraction of FDI by international companies into the Sultanate? Similarly, how is omanization affecting the market size in Oman and the appetite for foreign investment? Thank you. All right, uh, omanization is uh, ongoing concern in the local market. Uh, whether you look at it from the policymaker point of view who are concerned, about many young uh, adults who are looking for jobs and not able to get the right jobs. And at the same time, a lot of other jobs are available to non-locals uh, with different skills. So from the policymaking point of view, I think they have a big concern to address. Uh, from the private sector point of view, I think they look at it again as a constraining factors to expand and to grow, as well as to attract foreign investment. So, uh, I think we have to uh, reconcile these two views and we have to be able to bring everyone on board uh, because currently it seems that there is diversion and there is a bit of, uh, a, bit of a gap in, in communication to make sure that the uh, policy interests of the government can be uh, accommodated by the private sector that are operating in Oman, whether they are locals or from the uh, outside the country. So. Uh, if you ask, depending on who you ask, if you ask uh, a business uh, family or if you ask uh, an entrepreneur, they will look at uh, generally omanization as a constraint to growth and to uh, attract foreign investment. If you ask a government side, they find it to be a necessity. And obviously the public, uh, especially many of the youth who are looking for job opportunity, they see it as a must uh, and they have to push very hard to the point of uh, not accommodating the concern of the private sector. I think the gap is creating an issue, but I'm sure now the government is focused on addressing this gap and making sure there is more synchronized between the different government bodies. Hopefully that can be addressed effectively going forward. Thank you, Hatim. There's one last question that reaches us. It's, uh, I will read it to you. It says, good afternoon all. Thank you for your contributions. Is there a program initiated in Kuwait and Oman to encourage foreign companies to implement graduate schemes that employ local talent and enhance their skills as found in Europe and the US? As it has not been said to whom that question is being addressed, I would like to open it up to all the four panelists, maybe whoever likes to go first in addressing this question. How about Hassa being uh, first? Yes. Um, I know that there is quite to say, tequit, is it called tequit? So co foreign companies are required to employ a certain percentage of Kuwaitis. Now, if there is a um, a structured program that is announced and standardized among the company. I'm not aware of such thing. And um, I hope it's, it's, a, it's actually a good idea. And um, 
we do get a lot of feedback from local businesses on vocational skills of the graduates. So that would be a great way to improve their skills. Thank you. Thank you, Hesa. Hatim? All right. Uh, the government here has been trying very hard with public institutions as well as uh, private companies, uh, local or foreign. I can mention now that uh, recently the government has signed uh, an agreement with Huawei of uh, China to train Omanis uh, for uh, IT skills and computer skills in communication field. And this is uh, an ongoing program. I think that this is probably one of the latest one, but I can see, uh, for example, companies like uh, Shell, BP, uh, Oxy have been doing a lot of work for graduate training programs and they select young Omanis and induct them into a very rigorous program, upgrade their skills. There is similar programs with government entities. For example, the Oman Investment Authority has a program ongoing, and this is now being set as a role model for a number of other government institutions to apply, at least in this transition period between graduate uh, graduation and the job market. As the time is becoming longer and longer, these institutions are tapping the talents that are graduate and fresh to be trained and to be uh, prepared for the future without commitment to do jobs, a very small allowance to cover their cost of transportation. And this is being received uh, in a very positive way. Uh, again, uh, the government is working very hard with multinationals that are operating in Oman, trying to expand the scheme and try to put the young, educated, skill, uh, skill uh, students who are ready for the job market in proper training. As I mentioned, this latest one is for Huawei, and this is, uh, again, a step forward. The government is pushing very hard towards it, and hopefully uh, we can see more fruits of it in the future. Thank you so much, dear Hatim. Uh, at this point, yes, Hesa. If you may allow me, Hatim reminded me about uh, another program at Kuwait Investment Authority. So basically, Kuwait uh, Investment Authority owns shares in several companies around the world. And they have this three months program to train a number of Kuwaitis, um, so for example, in Goldman Sachs or in uh, UBS and all of those international companies operating abroad in uh, the US or in uh, London to train Kuwaitis. But the program is very short. I think it's two to three months, uh, not enough, and uh, just uh, covers the investment field. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you, Hesa. Thank you. At this point, I would like to conclude today's first session. We will convene tomorrow and we will continue tomorrow. Again, I would like to forward my sincere thanks to Dr. Hessa Aloyayan, Dr. Hatim Al-Shanfari, Ms. Noura Al-Lahu and Mr. Oliver Oems for their valuable contributions today. Also to all the panelists, also to everybody who was posing questions. And maybe I can give it to Fabian for the final remarks for today. From my side, thank you so much. And Fabian, it's yours. Thank you very much, Frank. And I would um, just like to take the opportunity to uh, thank our, our moderator. Frank, thank you for an excellent job uh, that you have been uh, doing today. And um, thanks to all the speakers. And I hope to see you again tomorrow. Thank you and have a good afternoon.